start the, our English session, we can have a one minute silent prayer so that we can uh, uh, pray to the God Almighty to shower their blessings to us. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you all. Uh, thank you. Today, uh, again, we, um, uh, we have the another wonderful speakers with us. And he is none other than Dr. Naveen Pawaskar. He had presented on this platform earlier also. And today he has come up with the new understandings, new phenomena. And what I have heard and what I have met, uh, talked to, to him, uh, he is an excellent uh, research oriented personality persons and who has graduated from the uh, Dhaul Institute and later on he was working at the Jim's uh, Homeopathic Medical College at Hyderabad. And still he's the consultant and he's the, I, see, I, I can say that he's the founder and a planner for the entire Jim's session. And uh, this is because of him uh, the gyms uh, has grown up like any uh, wonderful institutions in the in our Hyderabad region. And uh, uh, he has presented so many topics. He has been invited at, uh, and he has conducted so many uh, uh, studies like uh, homeopathic strategy, strategy for treatment of acute glomerulonephritis, and strategy for treatment of acute vital things and many more. I'm not going into the details uh, because uh, uh, there, there are many, uh, I must give, give him the time, sufficient time so that he can plan um, study. So doctor, thank you and doctor, I invite Dr. Naveen sir uh, to kindly start the, your session now. You can share your PPT sir. Yeah, it is visible, sir. It is visible. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, sir. Yeah, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, let me thank uh, Sani, sir, for inviting me onto this forum. And uh, I think I'm speaking here for the third time. And I'm very happy that I'm part of this forum. And I, uh, it allows us to share our experience. Uh, so today I am going to speak on uh, a study that was conducted way back in 19, between 1997 and 2000. And uh, this study is about acute glomerulonephritis in pediatric age. Um, to give you a background, uh, this was done in a hospital where I was working between 1997 and 2000 in a remote area in <clears throat> Andhra Pradesh. And uh, it was a 300-bedded rural hospital in which I was working as a homeopathic consultant. And there we conducted this particular study. There was cross-functional team of doctors. By that, I mean there was a pediatrician and there were other uh, doctors as well who were there with me in this particular team and study. Uh, I would like to bring this to uh, your notice that this, since this was done in 1997, uh, the lab investigations were very limited at that point of time. And today we could have done many more investigations. But nevertheless, the basic lab investigations were available for us to diagnose this particular condition. And uh, so hence, all our, uh, you know, therapeutic strategy or homeopathic therapeutic strategy was mainly based on clinical judgments. Uh, we also used one software at this point of time, uh, then was, which was named as Organon 96, which helped us understand uh, how to do potency selection, second prescription, etc. Now, before we go into uh, the homeopathic part of it, I thought it was important for us to revise what glomerulonephritis is. Glomerulonephritis signifies glomerular inflammation in which there is immunologically mediated injury to the glomeruli. 
so uh, usually this injury presents as what is called as nephritic syndrome there is another word called nephrotic syndrome but this is nephritic syndrome which is characterized by sudden onset of gross hematuria gross hematuria is something that you can observe uh, in the urine without microscopic study edema hypertension and various levels of renal insufficiency most of the time this is post streptococcal post streptococcal glomerulonephritis that means usually between uh, 2 to 4 weeks there will be a streptococcal infection prior to the glomerulonephritis because of the streptococcal infection there will be an antigen antibody reaction and that usually that antigen antibody reaction goes in the antigen or an antigen antibody complex goes and settles on the glomerular basement membrane and that causes this particular disease. Uh, there are other causes as well. Uh, usually, the streptococcal glomerulonephritis, there is nephritic, nephritogenic strain of group A beta hemolytic streptococci, which is specifically known to cause this particular disease. Uh, it is also associated with uh, many other diseases like SLE, uh, enoxcholine purpura, etc. And there are something called primary glomerular diseases, which is diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis or IgA nephropathy. Uh, so this is a range of etiology that can cause this nephritic syndrome. Now, basically what happens is, normally the immune complexes formed in our body are removed by the reticular endothelial system. This is a normal phenomenon. This is how all of us function. But in these cases, there is impaired ability on the part of the host to remove these immune complexes outside the body. And hence, the circulating immune complexes deposit on the glomerular capillary or glomerular capillary side of the glomerular basement membrane. The, there are two pathogenetic mechanisms. One is deposition of antigen and antibody complexes, which is called immune complexes. And the second mechanism is where the antibody itself deposits on the glomerular basement membrane, to which an antigen reacts when the deposition of antibody happens. Now, which means, in short, if we can just understand what it means by this is, that when you do a microscopic section of the uh, kidney, you can see that there are humps of uh, IgG and uh, antigen antibody complexes deposited onto the glomerular basement membrane. Now, what does it actually mean? I think, why do we need, uh, how do we interpret this knowledge in terms of homeopathy becomes important. I'm just uh, kind of trying to understand this entire pathophysiology, pathophysiological correlations and clinical uh, symptoms to understand how do we understand this from a homeopathic perspective. So basically, if you see AGN, though it presents as an acute uh, glomerulonephritis, it's termed as acute glomerulonephritis, but it is primarily because there is an aberrant, aberrant immune system. That means an inefficient reticuloendothelial system, which does not filter out the antigen-antibody complexes which a normal human being is supposed to filter out. So, you see this, there is a prior incidence to the acute uh, presentation of glomerulonephritis. Now, individuals' RE system has ability to clear this immune complexes, but those who are prone to these systems have this deficit of not being able to clear this antigen-antibody complexes. So, you can see that there is a, the acute glomerulonephritis does occur, but there is a prior priming of our uh, reticuloendothelial system, which is deficient in clearing the antigen-antibody complex. So, there are a lot of children who get exposed to streptococci, but not all of them get uh, acute glomerulonephritis. 
and that this must be one of the reasons why those children who have an aberrant immune response they are the one which are more vulnerable and prone to develop acute glomerulonephritis this is first part so you see there is a proneness part of it which means there is a certain miasmatic uh, you know predilection for those children who can develop this kind of a response now the second thing is what happens in the patho uh, as a pathology also needs to be understood the kidneys are enlarged the glomeruli appear enlarged but they are relatively bloodless and should diffuse mesenchymal proliferation so you see there is an aberrant immune reaction which sets this inflammatory reaction but what happens inside is that the kidneys actually swell up and the glomeruli appear bloodless they are not as if there is lot of congestion out over there they appear bloodless and show mesenchymal cell proliferation so on one hand there is avascularity followed following the aberrant immune reaction and on another hand there is swelling enlargement and proliferation so this needs to be understood from how the disease is responding from a miasmatic perspective as well so you'll see that there is aberrant immune reaction followed by inflammation and in inflammation there is swelling but that swelling is avascular and that avascularity causes lot of uh, what we call as filtration mechanism problems so uh, is agn actually an acute disease from you know if we try to understand this entire process though it is termed acute glomerulonephritis it is not actually a very acute disease as such because before it manifests there are lot of things that happen in the immune immune system two it is deep miasmatic a disease which has deep miasmatic inroads and that is why when we why we why i have been trying to discuss this with you is to make, give you an idea that it's not important to understand the nosological name but it is more important to understand what is behind that nosological name so your nosological name is acute glomerulonephritis but from a homeopathic perspective this is not necessarily an acute disease there is al already a chronic part which is you know miasmatic in nature which is actually setting up the stage for acute glomerulonephritis to express itself now that uh, from a homeopathic perspective it is important to know that basement membrane connective tissue and endothelial lining is targeted by this immune complexes causing deprivation of blood to the tissue and swelling so we got to understand that which miasmatic expression would work like this okay so from if you understand this discussion you will probably uh, realize that mostly it is the psychotic and the tubercular miasm which is the lays the central foundation for the child to fall prey to acute glomerulonephritis sora and syphilitic part are also there because any disease is multi miasmatic or it passes through different phases of miasm but predominantly acute glomerulonephritis lingers around the psychotubercular uh, miasm there is a small expression in sora and there is a relatively small expression in syphilitic uh, miasm as well but the central foundation is psychotubercular now let's look at the clinical features very quickly there is hematuria edema hypertension proteinuria and oliguria and along with that there are the general symptoms like malaise malaise and lethargy abdominal pain etc but there are a uh, you know there is a range of presentation that happens in uh, agn there is something called as asymptomatic microscopic hematuria which is a very minimalistic disease and with normal renal function to some patients who experience acute renal failure as well there are 
complications as uh, encephalopathy, hypertensive encephalopathy, or a heart failure. And uh, rarely there will be hypo hypervolumic or hypovolumic uh, heart failures as well. So you can see there is a minimalistic microscopic hematuria also. And on other hand, there is encephalopathy and heart failure also. Now, this is what I am trying to tell you. That at the two ends of the spectrum, there is a soric and encephalitic expression. But the majority of it is at the level of the psychotubercular part. Uh, edema typically presents from salt and water retention. And in around 10 to 20% of cases, there is development of nephrotic syndrome, which is a chronic expression. And there is an emergency situation that can also develop where there could be an issue such as a suspended animation when a subglottic edema develops, which causes airway, compre airway compression. Okay, so you see there is a range of expression, range of presentation in this acute glomerulonephritis from a very simple to a life-threatening situation. Now, it's important to understand how on the normal, how this beha disease behaves normally, normally in the sense in majority of people. Usually the pace of symptoms is very fast to appear, very rapid. Suddenly they will appear. One day there is nothing. And then the next day, you'll suddenly see the swelling and the edema coming up and microscopic hematuria uh, starting. Once they appear, they persist for weeks in spite of conventional treatment. So if you don't take homeopathy, but take modern medicine or don't treat it, the symptoms will persist for weeks. Typically, the symptoms take six to eight weeks to resolve. Proteinuria takes around four to six weeks. And hematuria sometimes can persist even for a year. And 60% of patients present with hypertension, out of which 10% go into encephalopathy. So you can see that it starts quickly, but it does not fade away quickly. It stays with the person for 6 to 8 weeks. So when we are treating this, how this becomes important for us? So when we are treating this particular case, these type of cases, it's important that our cases resolve much quicker than uh, much before six to eight weeks. If your case is resolving after six or eight weeks, it is quite possible that it has gone into a natural remission or the disease itself, because it being a self-limiting disease, has settled down by itself. And you can also understand that, uh, you know, other potential complications like hyperkalemia, heart failure, Acidosis, seizures in uremia are also uh, there. Now, it's important to understand that it is swift to appear but slow to disappear. And one important thing that we should understand is symptoms of kidney. Kidney does not produce uh, severe pain because the anatomical structure of kidney is such that there are very few neural ends into the kidney. The major majority of the neural ends into the nerves into the kidney are into its capsule. So unless the capsule actually gets stretched, it's very difficult to get pain and hence PQRS symptoms in the renal, uh, you know, cases of renal uh, diseases. I'm not talking of ureteric colics or I'm not talking of uh, pelvic ureteric junction stones because ureter has a lot of uh, nerve endings. Hence, the pain and expression comes up when there is a ureteric or a renal uh, ureteric colic or when there is a pelvic elastic colic, pelvic elastic uh, junction stone, but not in the renal parenchyma per se. This is a primary, uh, you know, parenchymal disease and hence the pain component of it is very very less why i am explaining this to you to the to you this is because you will understand as we go through the cases that there is hardly any pain and hence very peculiar pqrs symptoms are very very less so you will see that the, though most of the cases will have the common symptoms of oh i have painless hematuria my body is swollen up i have a facial edema I have pedal edema, I have ascites, 
uh, my blood pressure is high or something else but you will hardly see anybody coming up with any pqrs symptoms on a kidney renal renal level so what did we understand from all this swift to appear slow to disappear swollen kidneys without pain and avascular proliferative disease in the kidneys now it has other uh, complications as well which i have already spoken about accelerated hypertension and uh, uh, failure as well now uh, this is the table which gives you the four types of uh, glomerulonephritis we will mainly be dealing with the first column which is post streptococcal glomerulonephritis we are not uh, dealing with iga nephropathy or good pastures or rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis in this study and uh, yeah you can see that 10 to 20% can become nephrotic syndromes on almost 70% would have hypertension and a renal failure sets in in around 50% of patients okay uh so it's important that we understand the pattern of disease evolution and then see what is the peculiar individualistic feature in that general pattern for us to identify the peculiarity of that particular patient now this is these are the 10 sample cases we are going to discuss quickly and you can see that all of them had the classic trio of proteinuria hematuria hypertension and almost four of the four out four or five of them presented with oliguria one of them had ascites one of them went into hypertensive headaches and encephalopathy almost pre encephalopathy and one of them went into lvf so you can see three of them had major complications and all of them were hypertensive you can see the blood pressures of the children were ranging from uh, the lowest being 130 80 which is also high for a child to highest being 160 by 100 and it's important to also note that they also had a lot of associated complaints in form of other diseases like somebody had uh, aneurysis and abdominal colic other person had allergic dermatitis somebody some child had a bronchitis episodes uh, one had urti with pyoderma and csom etc etc now we'll start discussing one by one these cases to understand how strategies differ so this is the most simplest case that i uh, encountered in the entire series it's a case of 7 year old child girl child who presented with proteinuria edema and hematuria uh, with blood pressures of 130 by 80 and was oliguric now how did the complaint start the complaint actually started when uh, one of her uh, 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 friend who was sitting next to her in her classroom was scolded by uh, her teacher and she was scolded uh, strongly scolded uh, by her teacher and the that scolding impacted our patient because the patient was sitting next to the child which was getting scolded and who was her apparently her friend she was so scared that even when she came to the clinic after a couple of days she had a very stunned and a you know stunned looking a face which was almost like she was in a state of shock even after two days so we took a little bit of a detailed history and i'm writing only the key features that i could find out in that uh, the child was extremely fearful in nature she was thermally hot and she had craving for sweets now what happened is as soon as the the child uh, in the class the friend of her got scolded the same day the child developed an episode of fever uh what happened is like she was taken to the next door gp and that uh, general practitioner treated her with some basic paracetamol for her fever and uh, she was uh, apparently okay but as soon as the fever subsided 
within two days, all the complaints of acute glomerulonephritis developed. Now, this is the history. Okay, so what are we able to see in this case is a very simple reality. There is element from fright and shock and there is suppression. So you can see that who was scolded? The neighboring child. Who gets the impact? Our patient. She's still in a state of shock and she's so frightened that her face is stunned. And then what happens? She throws up a reaction in form of fever which is then, you know, the GP does what the, you know, they do treat symptoms and they have treated the fever part of it without actually taking care of the underlying cause. And that led to development of this full blown picture of AGN. On finding out the other symptoms, we found that the child was fearful. She was a hot patient and there was craving for sweet. So very simple cause and effect very uh, you know, quick response from the cause to the effect and a little bit of suppression leading to a final settling down into kidneys. But the expressions are still there on the face. So, you know, what we had to do is give her a single dose of opium. We just gave her opium 200, one single dose. And uh, we just kept the child on placebo. Now, what is important to understand is the type of response that we got. So normally, if you see, the edema takes around four weeks to respond. In this case, it responded within a day. Hypertension responded very quickly within 24-48 hours. So did the hematuria and proteinuria. So you can see that the disease which was supposed to last for four weeks responded very quickly to a single dose of opium in a span of less than three to four days. Now, what does it indicate? There were good characteristics. There was a cause and effect relationship that we could see in the case. And we could clearly make out how the disease has gone from one level of, uh, you know, to the next level. So this is indicative of a good susceptibility. And you can see from the response itself, that the response was very sharp, rapid, and it resolved quickly. This is very, very typical of soric expressions, which are there. There is a quick cause and effect relationship, complete reversibility of your symptoms and the pathology in short period of time with very, very few stimulations that need to be done from a homeopathic perspective. So this is how a soric acute glomerulonephritis would respond. And this is how you could find out that there is a very clear cause and effect relationship that led to this particular disease. Now, let us understand the second case. Now, this is about a 17-year-old child who had edema, oliguria, proteinuria, hypertension. It was a gradual onset, unlike the first case, which was like, uh, the cause was there and the next in next 24, 48 hours, the symptoms started coming out. This had a very gradual onset. Now, typically what happens is uh, most of the time we are tempted to treat edema, oliguria, proteinuria and look at this. And this was treated by one of uh, our colleagues uh, who gave APIS. And the patient responded to APIS for first few days. And thereafter, the progress stopped. Okay. And she developed ascites since last 15 days. And that's where uh, the colleague uh, consulted uh, us to uh, see if there was something else that needed to be done about this particular patient. So when we defined or understood the case, we found out that she was otherwise a very mild, yielding, bashful, affectionate type of a person who had aversion to milk and she was hot, thermally hot. And she also had del delayed menarche. So, menarche. So, uh, you know, it's no, there's no, uh, you know, no price for guessing the remedy. Uh, but what is important to understand is that though the disease was prescribed an acute remedy of epis, 
and which had helped for a while. Thereafter, there was no further improvement. So there was a bit of an amelioration followed by status quo. This is how Kent's observations would work. There was amelioration followed by status quo. So what do we do in such cases? Right? So what we, what we do is we prescribe a deep acting remedy which is complementary to the remedy which brought about the initial amelioration. Obviously, Epis and Pulsatilla has that kind of a relationship. So we had to just give one dose of Pulsatilla like you can see in this particular graph which is shown that after Epis there was some improvement followed by which the improvement slowed down and then there was a plateau. And then we had to give a complementary remedy to complete the cure which incidentally is also the chronic deep acting remedy for this particular child. Now in both these cases you must have seen that though the presentations had acute uh, uh, presentations both the times we required a deep acting constitutional remedy. Now let's look at this third case which is uh, also uh, very typical. Now in this case the patient, I'm not going to now keep repeating the, uh, you know, the common issues of edema hypertension. Now, the complaint started gradually uh, and it progressed over 10 days. And along with the AGN symptoms, the child also had dry cough uh, with bouts uh, of dry cough and dyspnea, which was worse in the midnight and while lying down. So you can see that there were two, two diseases going on simultaneously. One is uh, the acute glomerulonephritis and the other one is uh, something like bronchitis, which had cough and dyspnea, which was worse in the midnight and worse by lying down. Now, when we look at the chronic uh, uh, picture, the pre-morbid picture, we realize that we, we can see that Patient had patient was irritable, egoistic, disliked scoldings, extremely dominating, hot patient, craving for sweets, mucus, and so you can make out that probably the patient was more like a lycopodium child. But now, should we use lycopodium in this particular case at this point of time? That is the question. So there are two dissimilar diseases, as you can see. Aphorism thirty nine in Organon of Medicine talks about two dissimilar diseases uh, you know, occurring in the system at the same time. And the guideline that Organon tells us is to treat the disease which is, which is dominant and expressing itself with the characteristic showing the need of the patient to address to that particular disease first. Then the other disease which is uh, underlying will express itself and then we address the next one. So here it's, you know, we, we did the exact same thing. Cough in short bouts, aggravation midnight in a hot child, which was, uh, and worst by lying down, we prescribed arsenic iode first and then allowed the cough to settle down, which settled down in two days with few doses of arsenic iode and then we prescribed a single dose of lycopodium, which took care of the entire AGN episode. Now, why is it important to do this? We knew that lycopodium was the constitutional remedy, but it's important to first address the susceptibility, which is showing the dominant expressions at that point of time. Because even though you might know lycopodium is a constitutional remedy for this child, if it is not indicated at that point of time, it will not work. And this will take us on a ride because then we will start disbelieving in lycopodium for this particular case. And then we will go you know, on a long detour and come back. Sometimes we might come back. Sometimes we will get lost. So we will miss the opportunity to give the right remedy at that point of time. So it is important to understand that only indicated remedy works. If the remedy does not know what is its designation, whether it is an acute, whether it is an intercurrent or whether it is a constitutional, the remedies don't know these designations. 
all that they have to understand is that I am indicated and I I will have those the sensors which will absorb me and that is where the action starts. Okay, so uh, it's important to understand how, you know, uh, aphorisms and the guidelines given in the aphorisms help uh, can be seen in the practice and how they help us prescribe, make the, you know, give us the strategies for prescribing which remedy and at what time. Okay. And uh, we maintained, uh, this child was resolved within four days and we maintained the follow-up for three months and there was no relapse in this particular case. Now let's move to the case four. And here again, you can see that there was dyspnea along with the classic, uh, you know, character, common symptoms of blood pressure, high proteinuria and hematuria. And the duration of illness was 10 days. Absolutely no characteristic symptom. Absolutely no. So what we had to do is look at the pre-morbid picture. That means how was this child before he fell sick? So we studied him and we found out that he was obstinate in nature. Uh, he was very sensitive to being scolded. Uh, did not have the courage to speak in front of others. And he had fear of ghost and dreams of ghosts craving for sweet and pica and chill thermally chilly i think there's no uh, you know we don't have to discuss this remedy it's calcarea carb now what happened is we saw that it was slow lazy dislike for mental labor sensitive to reprimands lacks courage fear of ghosts dreams of ghosts craving sweets pica etc and there was a huge swelling so there was this tendency to accumulate that water now, so what we did was we gave single dose of calcarea cup, 200. Though the condition was only 10 days old, we gave a single dose of calcarea cup, which is a deep acting constitutional remedy. Now, the to our luck, uh, there was no response whatsoever. Calcarea cup did not produce any response. What we would normally be tempted to do is to change the potency or maybe change the remedy itself. Uh, that's a normal, that, I mean, we will be tempted to do that, seeing that, oh my God, there's so much of ascites, there's the blood pressure is not under control. There is a split in the second heart sound, which indicates that there is an impending failure. Let me quickly change the remedy because the press, clinical pressure is going to be there on what we realized is that why is this calcarea cup not helping? Then we gave a re thought to why, what are the possible reasons? Is calcarea cup wrong? Possibly, yes. Is there any other reason that could be there for calcarea cup not, you know, registering on this particular patient? And when, when we gave a thought, we realized that, see, from day one, the disease is slow. There's a lot of water accumulation. The disease is slow, but it's neither fading off, nor is it growing so large that it's causing complications. So it's like a phenomena where there is a lot of hovering of, you know, the disease is just hovering around there. It's neither receding, nor is it rising to a level where it causes a threat. And what is the characteristic? that there is huge accumulation of water, not so much of uh, you know, hematuria or blood pressure, but there is huge accumulation of water. So accumulation was out of proportion to the other three symptoms which were there. And then when we look at the personality, the personality itself is slow and lethargic and uh, not so active and not uh, you know, exhausted by any mental labor, etc., etc. So this whole thing pointed out towards psychotic, you know, miasm. And uh, about the psychotic miasm, they are, uh, you know, that is a miasm that requires a little more push. You know, it's like, uh, you know, it's like that Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall and then you have to push it to for the Humpty Dumpty to have a great fall. And that's exactly what psychotic miasm is. It will sit on a wall. 
it will not fall on the either side till you push it literally push it uh, across and allow it to fall but remember once it falls don't try and mess up with it once it starts falling down once it is uh, once it is ameliorating then we don't have to touch it so what we did is we just gave calcarea cup 200 three doses on one particular day okay so this is the discussion that i just now discussed with you and we just gave three doses and the improvement was gradual not magical and that's how psychotic uh, expressions or that's how psychotic miasm will respond it will like unlike sora where there is a magical improvement as you saw in the first case you gave a dose and within 48 hours everything resolved this case is not going to resolve in that order so we should know how this case is resolving so miasm becomes a prognostic factor if you understand the miasm i will in this case i wouldn't try to make it magical I will allow it to resolve at its own pace. So within next 10, 9 to 10 days, everything gradually resolved. Once we have pushed it across the wall, don't interfere with it. So we gave three doses and then just placebos. And slowly that entire psychotic miasmatic activity, uh, you know, resolved and the, the whole process resolved in 9 to 10 days. So, you know, that's the graphical representation of this. We, Anasaka, hypertension, you know, the most prominent symptom was Anasaka. Water, water, and water everywhere else. Everywhere. And the second bars that you see is with single dose, there was no change. And then within 24 hours, we repeated three doses of calcareca. Now, that was a risk. But it was a very calculated risk because we knew there was psychotic miasm. It's not going to go bizarre. It's not going to go out of action. It's not going to go out of control. And it was only, it just needs that momentum to move ahead. And once you give that, it will do its own job. So thereafter, it was all placebo. Now, we look at this uh, case number five, which is, again, a similar thing. Uh, you know, no characteristic symptoms. Uh, and this child had a uh, hard and rough look, insensitive to others, low on morals, a fear of dark, fear of alone, uh, anxiety about losing his physical possessions, etc., etc. And he was very naughty and uh, never bothered about others. So we thought maybe calcarea flu could be his remedy. And uh, again, once again, we looked at the pre-morbid attributes and we thought that maybe calcarea fluor could be the remedy. Now, what was important in this case is to understand that when we gave calcarea fluor, other symptoms were gradually responding, but blood pressure was just spiking up. So you see, there is a disproportionate response. One out of the four symptoms, the generals and the other four symptoms, three of them are trying to kind of respond, but one of them is just spiking up and not <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. One of them, that is especially hypertension, was not uh, coming under control. So you can see disproportionate responses are very typical of tuberculum myasma. And that is why we introduced one dose of tuberculinum 1M and then again repeated calcarea flu 200 in two or three doses for the response to come. So you see, we took psychotic miasm in a different way and this in a different way. We didn't go on repeating calcarea flu without introducing tuberculinum in this particular case. Now, in this case, what was peculiar is along with AGM, the child had a suppurative otitis media pyoderma, all at one time. And everything happened in, uh, in that particular moment itself. In six days, the child had AGN with dry cough, a CSOM and a pyoderma. And the CSOM and pyoderma was show, having yeah, you know yellow colored discharges. And when we defined the case, we found that he had this sibling jealousy 
and he is always lamenting about not being appreciated, etc. With skin, ear, and yellow discharges, hot. So it was very clear that the child would be more like a calcareous self child. Now, what was more important? Again, there was a prominent symptom. Then we had to address that particular prominent symptom before going to the constitutional medicine. So in this kidney disease with dry cough in short spells is alumina. So we prescribed single dose of alumina, which brought down the cough part of it and the spells of bouts of cough. And thereafter, once those bouts are gone, you see what is left is skin, ear, and with yellow discharges. And in a child which was pre pre-morbid also was more like a calcareous self. So for this, we gave calcareous self to him. But before introducing calcareous self, you can see other form of tubercular miasm in this particular case, which is having multiple infections at one time in one given system. So here again, alumina followed by one dose of tuberculinum 1M and then with a gap of 48 hours, described calcareous self 200 a deep acting remedy in one or two doses. So now you see this is now you see this strategy is different from the earlier one that you saw. We gave an acute remedy, then introduced an intercurrent remedy, and then we followed it up with calcareous self, which is the constitutional remedy. Why? You can see this child in six days developed three infections at the same time. So we need to understand how this system is reacting to the uh, along with AGN. Okay. Now, again, here, uh, this child was also like uh, lycopodium, the case, the case number 10 that we are talking about, is like, like the case, the deep acting remedy was more like lycopodium. But what was important is to understand once again that the all other symptoms were responding except the blood pressure. So rapid pace of the disease, no characteristic with low susceptibility because there was no characteristic, but the, my, the, the pace of the disease was very, very rapid. So in this case also, we prescribed tuberculinum 1M followed by calcarea, uh, lycopodium 200. And that is how uh, the case settled down. Now, again, once again, fluctuating response to lycopodium. And then when you introduce the anti-miasmatic, the response stabilizes. Okay, So you will see short amelorations with lycopodium. You will give one dose of lycopodium. There will be some amelioration. It will not be status quo, but it will bounce back. Then the second dose of lycopodium, some amelioration. And then again, a bounce back. So you will see these small spikes coming up and down, up and down. And that's where you should realize that the tubercular miasm is playing its role. So that's when we introduce tuberculinum one dose and then it settled that entire case with lycopodium. Now, this is very, very typical. Now that, you know, by this time I had got the hang of it. I thought I had the hang of it. And I started prescribing constitutionals to even to you know, cases left, right and center because I thought that was the answer. Now, in this case, you know, when we are when we get too complacent with our ju judgment, this is what happens. This patient had a so you know it looked like a calcarea force case to me. So I gave calcarea force in this particular case, not uh, you no know, respecting the fact that she also had abdominal colic, loose stools, and tenesmus with occipital headache. So I did not pay respect, uh, give, give importance to that. And I thought maybe because the earlier cases were responding to the deep acting constitutional remedies, I gave a calcarea first dose. And to my, uh, you know, I wouldn't say surprise, it was my ignorance that, uh, you know, I had missed the bus because I did not give attention to the indications that were there in the case. And I went with the fact that, oh, no, deep acting remedies work well. So it, the calcarea force did not at all work in this particular case. And so I had to review the case. And then I understood that it was a combination of two remedies, two types of thing. One is like an occipital headache with hypertension, which was very similar to viratrum viridi. And then you had something like an abdominal colic, loose tools with tenesmus, 
which is very similar to Naxomica or Merck. So I said, what is this that we have a com? You know, the presentation is a combination of two remedies. Uh, then you know, one like Viratrum viridi at the top, and Naxomica or Merck Merc or like or like symptoms at the bottom. So what is this? And that's when I realized that this could be terebinth because terebinth is a combination of these two presentations. So there is Viratrum viridi like symptoms at the head, and colic and uh, congestion is the important part of uh, terebinth. There's congestion in the head and there's congestion in the renal system. So that is where terebinth was used in this particular case, a single dose, which cleared that entire case. And followed by which, to avoid any further relapse, we prescribed the constitutional remedy, calcarea. So you see, different strategies have to be used for different cases based on their individualized features. This is the last case and we'll quickly review, uh, finish this. So this patient was already in failure. Hypertension was 160 by, I mean, blood pressure was 160 by 100. There was a third uh, heart sound audible and there were coarse crepitations in the chest. And when we defined the case, we realized that she was more like lachesis. Now the query is that should we prescribe lachesis in this situation where she is in, you know, uh, con CCF, congestive cardiac failure, should we prescribe it? What does our, uh, you know, organon say? So important thing to understand is when vital organs are involved and when the disease is very aggressively progressive, it is important to understand that even though we know the deep acting remedy, it would be dangerous to prescribe a deep acting remedy in this point of, at this point of time, because we might push the person into prolonged homeopathic aggravation, which could be very dangerous in this particular situation because the vital organs were involved. Or we can even push the person into what we call as if the vitality is poor, in this case it was not, but in, if the vitality is poor, then we might push the patient into what we call as killer's aggravation. So using deep acting remedy in critical situations is sometimes very, very dangerous. So what is the answer that Organon tells us? Find out a remedy which is related to the deep acting remedy and is not and which is superficial but covers the symptomatology which is causing the criticality. So in this case, a remedy which is related to lachesis which covers the cardiovascular system and the CCF was R-Syode. So we prescribed R-Syode in 30, 30 potency. It brought down the CCF were drive into under control and then once the CCF the child was out of the CCF that is the time when we prescribed 200 uh, lachesis in uh, a single dose lachesis in single dose now why do we do that because we know that there, there is a lurking syphilitic miasm in this particular case and if we try to do a little more aggressive work on this it is likely that we will cause a irreversible aggravation in this particular child. So you see the first case which we saw of opium was very swift, quick, nice and easy to resolve which was soric. Then we saw in between how psychotic miasm responds with you know like a humpty dumpty and hovering thing where we have to push it and then we see the fluctuating uh, you know erratic uh, uh, tubercular miasm and this is the last case where we see that the syphilitic miasm is lurking and we need to be careful when syphilitic miasm is lurking. So we used a superficially acting remedy related to the constitutional remedy, which covered the pathophysiology of that particular case in terms of CCF and then followed it up with the constitutional remedy. So this is how the graphical representation would look when you look at the arsenic iodine and lachesis combination. So you can see in this table, the therapeutic strategy table, we can see that, see, in some cases, you needed single doses. In few, you needed two or three doses. And very, very rarely, you needed a frequent dose. That is more than three doses. You can see the miasmatic uh, correlations over there. The first case of opium, and then the psychotic cases, and then the tubercular, and then tubercular syphilitic and syphilitic cases. We used directly chronic remedies to start with, or we have used in some cases acute remedy followed by chronic. In some cases, we have used acute intercurrent and chronic in sequence. So you see, there were various uh, 
strategies that we had to build up based on what is our understanding of individualization, what is our understanding of susceptibility, and what is our understanding of miasm. Okay. Now, sir, I'll just quickly do it in two minutes. It won't take more than this. Yes. So, looking at this, we can see that. Uh, so, how did this entire series respond? So, I had brought this to your notice right in the beginning that 20, uh, you know, four to six four to six weeks is the time required for edema, proteinuria, hematuria, and hypertension to settle down. 20% of these cases settled in four days. Another 30% settled in eight days. And another 40% settled in 12 days. So you can see that you know, almost 90% uh, of the cases settled in less than two weeks. That's less than half the time required by conventional medicine. Or when you are uh, when or when the patient is not treated, and only around ten percent cases required more around two weeks or less than just around fifteen days. Sixty percent of the time, though the disease is called acute glomerulonephritis, a chronic remedy was required to start the case, and only forty percent of the cases required acute remedies. We used antimiasmatic in thirty percent of the cases. And no antimyosinmatic was required in 70% of the cases. The most common frequency which gave beautiful result was 200C. And in some, around 18%, we required 1M. Single doses were used in 69% of the cases. And around 31% of the cases required more than 3 doses. 10% of the cases showed soric and syphilitic expressions, whereas most of the others, 40% showed psychotic miasm and around 50% showed tubercular miasm. Most important, around 20% of the cases treated with modern medicine relapse. In this entire series, nobody had a relapse when we followed for 6 to 8 months. So in conclusion, to be very, very frank, if we understand, I'm not going to take this beyond this point. I think we've understood that acute glomerulonephritis is very, very much amenable to homeopathy treatment. And our results are far more uh, deep, far more smoother, and they are far more better in terms of quality than when treated with conventional medicine. Thank you very much for your uh, patient listening. Mm -hmm. And this paper is uploaded on one of the websites. And I, if anybody wants, I can send you the link. It's a free download for anybody who wishes to read it. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Time to convert. Don't have time for discussion. Nice presentation. And in this era, because of the administration of a lot of uh, chemical medicines, definitely a lot of patients are prone to develop these symptoms as well as a suppressive treatment also causing or igniting such problems. A wonderful presentation. And on behalf of IFPH, I'm expressing sincere thanks to Dr. Naveen Pawaska and Wish that all of you enjoy the program. Hope you will be back again tomorrow. Till then, goodbye. And our Dr. Mariama 